Good evening. Welcome to Merlin Rise Evening Service. Tonight we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. I'll be looking at Acts chapter 5 verses 12 to 42. It's a big chunk of scripture, so I'll pray and then I'll get into it. Father, I just thank you for this evening. Help me, Lord, I pray through the power of the Spirit to discern your words. I pray I can bless the hearers because of you, Lord Jesus, and your Spirit. So help us now as we look at your word. And I thank you, Father, that your word is what feeds us. Help us to appreciate your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So let's read. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to be put, put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honoured by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Thedas appeared, claiming men, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. 
for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. As I said, it's a big chunk of scripture and it's, there's so much in it, but I'm going to try and be laser pointed in what I'm going to share this evening. The title of my message is Persecution. It comes with the territory of obedience. As an overview, we can see in these early chapters of the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit working in a miraculous way through the apostles whom God, God had chosen as leaders, whom God has chosen as leaders. And he, he chose us as well. He chose us. He chose you. He chose me. And it's always important to remember that, that we have been chosen by God. The miracles always glorified God. They glorified God, not man. And again, that's an important point that we must remember when we pray for people and praise the Lord when people get healed. Give God the glory. Amen. The early church leaders realized that obedience to God would result in the loss of personal freedoms and liberties. For the disciples, this was the cost of following Christ. It came with the territory of obedience. And as I said, my title tonight is Persecution. It comes with the territory of obedience. And so the challenge tonight is, are we prepared to pay the cost of obedience in our lives, in our families, in our communities, and in our nation in these troubling times? And times of challenge, challenge to the faith that we believe in. This miraculous gospel power created a tension in the listeners between being drawn and being repulsed, being repulsed by the message. A tension between obedience and disobedience, and ultimately a tension between fa faith and fear, a tension between faith and fear. Last week, Pradeep spoke of the attack from within, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. The story would have quickly circulated and how God had struck Ananias and Sapphira dead because of a dodgy land deal where they didn't give a full amount. They were lying to the spirit and God struck them dead. That would have struck fear in the people for obvious reasons. And the whole church would have been in fear at that witness. As in Acts 5, 13 to 14, it says, No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord. So we can see there is a tension between fear and faith being played out here in our passage. Fear possibly because of the story of Ananias and Sapphira, but also fear of the priests and the authorities who are jealous of the power that uh, the disciples were displaying. For the disciples, the consequence of preaching the gospel was yet another spell in prison. The disciples were regarded as common criminals and therefore they were thrown into a public jail with hardened convicts. Today, all over the world, Christians are being challenged in their faith for standing up to the truth of God's words. They've been persecuted. And you might think that it doesn't happen in our country, but I'd like to play you a short clip of a video about a guy called Mark Overd, who has recently been challenged over his street preaching. So let's watch the video. My name is Mike Overd. Um, I'm a Christian preacher, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ on the street 
and I have an upcoming civil injunction case against me on the 5th of October in Bristol. Well, the agenda right from the start has been to silence me and remove me from the street. Um, and they keep trying and keep failing um, with harassment and misuse of Section 35s, uh, banning me from town centre on several occasions as well. So there's been numerous uh, attacks to try and stop me going out and, and continuing to be on the street. Well, they failed in the criminal court after several attempts over farcical accusations, not hardly criminal, there's nothing criminal in, in the actual accusations, I believe, that they made. Um, so they had no other avenues to go down but to try a civil injunction, which would be a criminal behaviour order. So to criminalise the preaching of the gospel. And uh, two police officers turned up at the door uh, with a 92 pack sheets of um, statements and the like and points and served me the civil injunction several weeks ago, um, early in the morning. So um, yeah, this is the, uh, their only course of action to take really now. I'm pleased to say, uh, following his court case on the 5th of October, Mike has been allowed to continue his street preaching. It was ridiculous that it ever went to court. But can you see how subtle our freedoms, freedoms of speech, are being eroded? And we have to stand up for what we believe in. We have to obey God rather than man. And it comes with the territory of obedience. Mike was just being obedient to the call of God on his life. Mike said after winning his case, my motivation for preaching the gospel is my love for Jesus and my deep concern for people who do not know his great love. Not all of us are street pre preachers. <laughs> not all of us are street preachers. Thank the Lord for that day. Eh? Although I have done a little bit of street preaching in my life, and I quite enjoyed it, really. However, the love of the Lord should be our motivation in everything that we do, even if it's not street preaching. Everything we do should be motivated by love. It says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, that we are told to count the cost of following Christ and being obedient to his commands. Therefore, as there is so much in these verses tonight, as we have read, it's a big chunk of scripture, I'm not going through every detail. I'm going to focus on verse 29, which says, we must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. I have three points of application to make. When we obey God rather than man, we will get a reaction. We will definitely get a reaction. Number two, when we obey God rather than man, we gain freedom and a desire to glorify God. And finally, number three, when we obey God rather than man, nothing can stop us. So number one, when we obey God, we will get a reaction. It is important to emphasize that we are told to submit to governing authorities. In Romans 13 verse 1, it tells us, and Paul speaking, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, established by God. However, we are not called to submit to evil authority and authority that calls us to violate our God-ordained conscience by compromising the word of God and things we believe in as Christians. That's so vitally important to remember. We don't obey evil authority. Having our civil liberties violated, as Michael Verd has experienced, by the failed attempt by the Somerset police to shut him down and stop him preaching. 
governments and authorities should never be allowed to make us act contrary to our conscience and our call to obedience. This is a tension that exists between human authority versus God authority. And I know what side I'd like to be on. I'd rather be under God's authority always in my life. The tension has always existed between church and state. I like what Wayne Grudem writes in his book, Systematic Theology, about the church and the power of the state. He says, the Christian faith can stand on its own two feet and compete very well in the marketplace of ideas in any society and in any culture, provided, so grab a hold of this, provided it has the freedom to do so. Sadly, through a pressure of political correctness and the appeasement of the global church, the freedoms of Christians worldwide are being eroded. That's a simple fact. Our freedoms as Christians, even in this country, as we've seen with the example of Michael Verd, are subtly being er eroded. And in lots of countries, it's not so subtle. It's like the days of the apostles. They're put in prison and persecuted. Obeying God will always get a response. You guaranteed a response. The gospel was always meant to get a response. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus doesn't allow us to sit on the fence of indecision. Sorry, folks. <laughs> You're not allowed to sit on the fence of indecision. The book of Revelation describes the church of Laodicea as lukewarm. In Revelation 3, it says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I don't know about you, but I hate lukewarm coffee or tea. It's disgusting, isn't it? Jesus wants you fired up for him. So don't be lukewarm. Get some Holy Spirit fire in your bellies. The response towards the apostles was extreme, with often the threat of death and, at the minimum, a severe beating. Today, the reaction is more of an attitude of political correctness and an application by the church of trying to please man rather than God, a compromising of the truth of God's word so that people are not offended. Galatians 1 verse 10 reads, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? This is Paul speaking. Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's Galatians 1 verse 10. Paul is very clear that it is better to please God than man and not to compromise his faith. I feel we need to ask ourselves this evening the same question. How far are we prepared to go down that road of compromise? Number two, when we obey God rather than man, we gain freedom and a desire to glorify God. And freedom is not necessarily avoiding persecution or being locked up in a stinking prison. It's not. Freedom isn't that in the spirit of God. Let me give you an example. A Romanian couple, Richard and Sabina Wombrand, you might have heard of, them, heard of them, were such people who had freedom, but they didn't have physical freedom. Let me read a bit of their story. After the, the war, the Second World War, that is, a million Russian troops poured into Romania. Richard, a Lutheran minister, preached boldly to the Russian troops and resisted to swear loyalty to the atheistic rule of the communists. On one occasion, the Wombrands were invited to the Congress of the Cults. What a name, the Congress of the Cults. 
And so the communist regime treated every religion. They were cults. The Congress was broadcast live throughout the country. About 4,000 people attended. Pastors, bishops, rabbis, people high up in the Communist Party. And yet many religions abandoned their faith under the threat of communist persecution and openly swore allegiance to the communists. Sabina, Wurmbrand's wife, could not stand it any longer and told Richard, and this is what she said, isn't this powerful? Stand up and wash away the shame from the face of Christ. Knowing the cost, Richard stood up and declared to all that their loyalty, and grab a hold of this, their loyalty was to Jesus Christ first, first and to obey him. Their loyalty was to Jesus Christ first and to obey him. And that's what they said in front of all these communists, these generals. But they knew what was going to happen, sadly. Richard was kidnapped by the communists. The secret police grabbed him and Sabina Wurmbrand um, ended up 14 years in a prison being tortured and persecuted by his captors. 14 years. And Sabina ended up in a, a labour camp. It was such brutality. However, many Russian soldiers and guards came to faith during this time. Richard Wurmbrand and his wife survived the horror and set up an organisation called The Voice of the Martyrs. And there's a movie out at the moment called Persecution, Persecuted for Christ is the life story of the Wurmbrands. And I thoroughly recommend you watch it. It's a powerful film. I, no holds bad. It shows exactly what happened to them in this uh, Russian communist prison. They were brutally treated. And I, I use the word intentionally. This is an amazing story of faith and obedience, love and determination to preach the gospel, even if it meant torture or death. Richard and Sabina were never captives. Could you get that? They were never captives. Yes, they may have been physically in chains, but free in the spirit because of their wholehearted love for Christ. Hallelujah. The chorus of Chris Tomlin's version of Amazing Grace goes, my chains have gone, I've been set free. My God, my Saviour has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Our lives have been bought at a price, a precious price, the blood of Jesus. Our lives are no longer ours to lose or to gain, but belong to Christ. And I feel there's a truth there that brings such wonderful freedom and faith to trust God, irrespective of what life might throw out of us, at us. You might be going through a particularly bad time at the moment, but trust in his unfailing love and faithfulness. You've been set free from whatever you're facing. You've been set free. Just as the Wombrands survived such horror, but they were free in the spirit. We see the disciples in our passage in prison for preaching Christ. To, but God always has a plan. Aren't you glad this evening that God has a plan for your life? Richard Wormbrand wrote before his death, Our lives are planned in eternity. I love that. Our lives are planned in eternity. Our lives serve God's purpose. I can be confident even when I understand nothing. What a powerful statement. Let me read it again. Our lives are planned in eternity. Our lives serve God's purpose. I can be confident even when I understand nothing. We don't always understand what happens to us when we suffer, when we go through hardship. We don't understand it. Let's be honest. But, but our lives are planned in eternity. Isn't that a wonderful statement? I love that statement. I, I think it's such a powerful statement that we can be so 
securing and I can't emphasize it enough you know and if we lose sight of that our lives are formed in eternity we lose something really special God does rescue the disciples in our passage but their newfound freedom had one purpose to continue to preach the message verse 20 reads go stand in the temple courts he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. I wonder what the, the apostles were thinking as they uh, were arrested and then freed and then told to go back to uh, square one, preaching, in the, gospel, preaching the gospel in, in, the, in the temple courts. Um, they must have thought, hey, we're free. No, get back to preaching the gospel. That's the freedom that we have. It's always for a purpose, and that mainly it's to preach the gospel and share God's love. That is true freedom in Christ, being obedient and bringing glory to the name of Jesus, whatever may happen. Obedience to the gospel and to Christ brings freedom of the spirit, but also, on occasion, physical freedom. Galatians 5 verse 1 reads, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The Sadducees wanted to put the people under religious bondage. That is why they tried to crush the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, the gospel brings freedom as we obey the call of Christ on our lives. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Preach the word of God, be prepared whether the time is favourable or not. I believe in these uncertain times, we have a wonderful opportunity to share the word of God. It's a perfect time. Our generation is born for such a time as this, of freedoms both physically through COVID, but also spiritually through authority and liberalist attitudes and humanist agenda are trying to shut down the gospel and everything we Christians believe in, in society. What does our society need now more than any time in its history? Jesus, to know the good news of Jesus Christ. One of the founding fathers of the USA, Alexander Hamilton, once said, those that stand for nothing fall for everything. I believe that we as Christians have been falling for everything and anything for too many years. In our compromise and trying to please man rather than God, we have let something valuable slip. We cry out for the power of God to work in our lives, in our services, in our communities. But what are we doing? We're compromising the word of God. And yet we still expect God's word to work in power. No, we've got to preach the, the unadulterated word of God in its purest form, with all its truth, without compromise. The book of Jude warns against false teachers who do not teach the words of Christ. Jude 18 verse 20 reads, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. We can see that. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. That is freedom, my friends. Freedom and eternal life in Christ. And finally, number three, when we obey God rather than man, nothing can stop us. Hallelujah. As with the Wurmbrands, as with the Michael Verds of this world, when we obey God and stand up for the gospel, nothing can stop us from fulfilling his plans. Not our plans, but his plans for our lives. Our passage tells us the following, verse 38 to 39. Therefore, in the present case, referring to the apostles and Gamaliel speaking, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go 
For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Hallelujah. Nothing can stop the word of God going forward. Here we are 2,000 years later and the word of God is still being preached. The word of God is still going forward. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. And yet the word of God is still here. There have been predictions about the church fading, dying, going into extinction. Rubbish, rubbish. The church of Jesus Christ is stronger than ever. Worldwide, it's str and we're part of two billion people worldwide. That's mighty. We're not part of something small. We're part of something huge. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that give you a, a confidence that Jesus Christ is doing something in our generation? Yes, Matthew. Matthew 24 verse 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never pass away. The story of the Vombrands reminds us all that Jesus calls us, calls us into seemingly impossible and unbearable situations at times where faith is not only possible but unshakable. In these times we are living in, is our faith unshakable? The call to unshakable faith in Christ is never possible in our own abilities in our own efforts or power it is only possible through the power of the holy spirit that is within us so let us never forget that never forget that it's the power of god in you that gives you the unshakable faith to bear any challenge in your life it is a call to obedience that lies totally in the sufficiency of jesus christ the kind of obedience that comes with the territory of persecution. That obedience will get us noticed. As Michael Verd experienced, as the Vombrands experienced, and countless other people down through the history of the church. And we are no different. But it's important that we always obey God rather than man. Yes, our obedience will bring a reaction, often negative, as we've learned tonight, but we will gain a freedom in Christ, a freedom in Christ to be a living testimony of God's faithfulness in every challenge, a testimony of obedience that no man or authority can stop because God is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over all things. Amen. So let me pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. Help us to obey you, Lord Jesus, rather than man. Lord, when we are called to compromise or lay some truth down, help us to stand up for the truth of your words. Help us never to compromise in our lives, in our families, in our communities, but help us to lovingly, lovingly stand for what you've called us to stand for. And I pray, Lord, that we will see a change in our communities, in our societies, in our generation, the generation that we are called to live in, but also to impact with unshakable faith the, the communities and the generation that we're living in, Lord. Lord, help us. Fill us with your spirit. Refresh us, Lord, I pray. And help us all, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be in this age that we are living in. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. Have a great week. And I'll see you soon. God bless.